Hello, good evening, good night, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you're listening to and welcome to Chatterbox, the podcast where we speak to different artists about their creative odysseys, what they do, where they do it, how they do it, why they do it, when they do it, but most importantly, how they're trying to navigate the business world to monetize their craft while staying true to their creative side. My name is Eric and I'm the host of this particular show and in this installment we are graced by the presence of someone who I think the show director described as Nairobi personified. Patricia Kihoro (laughs) is a singer, a dancer, an actress, a model, a radio host, an event host, a fashion icon, a comedian for improv comedy, a blaze mentor, a travel blogger, a social media influencer, and generally just a cool person. Like, she's so down to earth, you wouldn't believe it. Patricia. <laughs> yes. Welcome to the show. Wow. Wow. You have really, really added to my portfolio. You're welcome. <laughs> but you know what? Uh-huh. It's cool. I'll take it. I'll take them all. Take it. Take it. Thank <laughs> you, Patricia. It's so nice to have you. Like, it. when I spoke to you on the phone and said we we're trying to get you on the show, you were like, yeah. <laughs> and at first I, I was not sure you had said yes I was like um, and it's really nice and, and we have food and you were like yes I said yes <laughs> so it, it was so nice of you to say that oh thank you thanks for reaching out uh, thank you for agreeing to come and I, I want to start with an embarrassing story for me not for you um, 2013 I'm at Oliver Tambo airport in Johannesburg and I'm rushing for my flight to go to Cape Town because I'm late mm-hmm. And from the corner of my eye, I see a familiar face. And I turn around and I start rushing towards her. And I, I start calling out. I'm like, Patricia, Patricia Kihoro. And she doesn't turn around. And I keep following her. And as soon as I'm just going to tap her shoulder, a huge security guy stands in between us and pushes me to the side. And this lady turns around and says, I'm really sorry. I, I think you have the wrong person. And... This stands out to be your doppelganger. This is Lyra, a singer, actress, radio host, Mm -hmm. model. Like, it's basically (laughs) you, but South Africa. Let's see. Like, there's a picture we're going to show here. Yeah. There's a picture we're showing here right now of you and Lyra side by side. She's my sis. Imagine that. Imagine, And she does what you do. And so the reason I wanted to start... This with that story is that so Lyra knows that I'm not a stalker and that I didn't make you up. You know, it's funny because the first time I saw Lyra on TV, yeah, uh, it was a song of hers on Channel O, mm-hmm. and my dad just went, "Huh, yeah. Wangeshi?" Because <laughs> they call me Wangeshi, yeah. and they're like, "What are you doing on TV?" And I'm like, "Hmm, that's not me, but." She's, what? she's cool. Yeah. You should yeah. have asked, what do you know, Dad? <laughs> Why you... You in, tell yeah, me. Yeah, you tell me. What's what am I here? doing on TV? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> yeah, but I love her. It's I amazing. Her. And and you too. And she's so cool because mm-hmm. we met a while after that, I think, in Cape Town. Mm-hmm. And she was so cool. And I went over and I introduced myself. I said, I'm the guy who was mistaking you for someone else at the airport. And he says, ah, oh, the crazy guy. I said, yes, <laughs> yes, that's me. So it's really nice to know that... Your doppelganger is just as cool as you are. and She, she is wonderful. Yeah. I have watched her perform three times. Uh-huh. The first time is when I was working as Emmanuel Jumbo's photography assistant. Yes. So she was performing and Emmanuel was the official, official photographer. photographer yeah. So I got to be on stage nice. to take pictures of her. And I remember with the camera just holding it like this and staring. At yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but also just because she's so fabulous and yes. fantastic. Then the second time was Blankets and Wine. Yeah. I think 2012, maybe. Yeah. And I remember she started to perform. I was in the audience. Yeah. And as soon as she came on stage... And she started to sing. I started to cry, and I was like, "Oh, this is this is what it this is what it feels like." Because I'd never understood yeah. why people like lose their their mind shit yeah. when they're watching someone and they're crying. I'm like, "Why are you crying?" That was me. I was like, oh "But my you're God. crying because you're looking <laughs> oh at you." Like I couldn't believe it. I was like, "Oh, so this is it? This is I'm feeling emotion." <laughs> and the third time was Koroga Festival. Yes. I think maybe two or three years ago, mm-hmm. um, at the Arboretum. Yes. And because you know, I had friends who worked at Capital, Capital yeah, and they would usually see me um, mm-hmm. getting really enthusiastic about the arts. Mm-hmm. So they'd call me and get me now get to be, be yeah. um, like 
you know that barrier there's the barrier yeah. here i'd usually be in the front row then yeah. they'd call me so that i go in Around and then the i'm now between the stage and the barrier so fun I girl was, number one so I, i remember just watching her and like being like in love again like this woman is amazing but i didn't get to meet her yeah, yeah. oh not yet i didn't get to meet her so after the show yeah. walking to the car you know how the abortum is and yeah. you're leaving walking to the car and then this car just pulls up behind us and then i just hear somebody saying hey hey and i turn around and it's like hey come here i mean re- i i really wanted to meet you because yeah. she could see me like practically singing along to every yeah. single song yeah, yeah. and like just being a, like adoring her and she was like come let's take a picture it's really nice to meet you da, da, da. and i was like this is sis. <laughs> you are my sister now yeah that's you you too you too here's one thing i would want to see you and lira on stage it it would just cause the same way you you talk about lira and how much emotion she invokes in you it's the same way you invoke a lot of emotion in a lot of us <laughs> i'm fan galling right now fan boy it's yeah, one of those. Sure no it's yeah, true it's true yeah. that's why listen i don't even think i should be conducting this interview i feel such like i feel like an imposter like imposter syndrome is very strong right now because you've done this professionally you've actually <laughs> been paid to do this and so right now i don't feel worthy to basically oy, interview oy, patricia kihoro but i will try my best because you, as as you said before like during when we were setting up she said you can be the best little something you want to be and that's what i'm here for <laughs> patricia let's start our conversation with how a lot of us got to know you or got acquainted with you mm-hmm. is um I'm curious to know if you'll remember how we first No, interacted. I remember how we first met, <laughs> okay. but how I got acquainted to you was number one through uh music competitions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh you did a couple of music competitions, but then the one I remember very fondly was Tasker Project Fame yeah. where you were quarter finalist, which I felt was horrible because I wanted you to win. Thank you. I was rooting for you and you were really the best. But the question here is How does it feel to be in a reality TV show that actually calls upon your talent and your skills and you're competing against other people not just one of these real housewives of Kayoli and I don't know keeping up with the who not mm-hmm. how does that feel It was it was interesting because one I wasn't that enthusiastic about getting into project fame mm-hmm. it was really a, a bunch of my close friends who really pushed me pushed to do it. In, yeah. And for me I was just like, ah, it's a it's a reality show because there's an element of the whole big brother thing yeah. to it and I just didn't I was like I don't think I want to be part of a reality show. Like, you know, but they were like, no, but this is singing and I think you can do it and my friend Renee at the time even said I'm going to go audition with you even though I know like she just said we're going to audition together. Yeah. So we went, we auditioned and it just i kept getting surprised that i was getting to the next step you know <laughs> i wasn't it's just okay fine i'm next um, i've gotten to the next, next thing, level. and the next, next one level. and the next one and then i remember the day we had to now perform to get into the house the first time it was now this televised thing yeah it wasn't it, it still wasn't a sure thing that i was in you, the house yeah. there were some people who were definitely in and then some of us had to sing on the day on yeah. stage to get in and i remember just thinking okay this is like where it ends for me mm-hmm. and then my name was called to go in so i remember walking into that house looking around like am i really here is this real life <laughs> and so on that day that night when we got in i was just like you know what okay I'm not really in this to win. I just hope I get to the final yeah. so that I don't watch this from home. From home, yeah. I don't want to be evicted and then have to watch the rest of it from home. So that was my goal just to make it to the last. The day. last. Yeah. And and it's 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 ironic because a couple of years later or a number of years later, you were a judge on a reality TV show. Was this your opportunity to be like Now I have the power. <laughs> I I it's it's like Thanos now you can snap and people are off. You know the kid who used yeah, to be bullied God. actually usually becomes the bully. It was very opposite. Yeah? I remember even before that. So that that um singing competition at le- the thing I liked it didn't have the element of the staying in a house yeah. and you know the drama and things. It was basically just people singing. But a couple of years before that Fena Fena who's my friend yeah. had asked me to help her audition for some guys to join her on stage to be a background vocalist, vocalist for her yeah. for a big gig 
and she'd never worked with background vocalists before. So she called on me and I think, I don't remember who else. And we, we were at Alliance Francaise, like, you know, in the under, underground, yeah, yeah. In the parking, there's a recording room, uh, like a studio, a studio for yeah. uh, rehearsals. And she asked me to help her just sift through guys and pick a couple of people. Mm-hmm. And it was so gut-wrenching for me yeah. to listen to people sing and hear that they're all really good and, you have and they're amazing. Them. And now we have to choose them based on things like personality. personality yeah. And so trying to tell someone you're not the one, and it's not because you're, you're singing, you're but you're a great bad, yeah. singer. I was on the verge of tears, to be honest. This was me. We love you so much, <laughs> but it's not for you. But you're so good. I, I just said, I don't ever want to do this again. Yeah. And so when the the, the, search, yeah. the search came about, he re- like I re- they really had to sell it to me. Mm-hmm. They really had to convince me to do it. So I walked into this not as, okay, I'm here to be like a... Yeah, out, out in. Uh, yeah, it was very... And I liked that it was very compassionate. Yeah. It wasn't about making fun of people. No drama, yeah. There was no drama. It was really just about the talent. And I remember... The Suzia who ended up winning, winning yeah. I remember seeing her in the bathroom on the day of the auditions and getting so excited because I was like, I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. Not because, you know, you could win or anything, but I was like, I'm so glad people will get to hear, to you, hear you sing, sing. Yeah. because that's another thing about platforms like those. Even though you don't win people get to hear your yeah, talent. Yeah. And then that can provide different opportunities. Exactly. That's, that's really nice. And compa- and I'm not even surprised that you're that compassionate <laughs> as a person. But the funny thing is that this was not actually your, this is not your first time on this show. We had you on this show, uh, the previous episode, uh, via a cameo on the Just a Band video. Oh. Uh, hi. Mm. And so it's always mm. nice to have people who've already been on the show. <laughs> and... That was really good because that was the first time I got to see you act Mm -hmm. for me. I'd not seen you act else. I know you had been on stage for a bit. But then how did you transition into acting or have you always been acting and singing at the same time? So, so, wow, so how far back can I go? So when I was young, like maybe five, six, seven, Mm -hmm. I would go to church and I didn't particularly enjoy church. Like it, for me, it was just, you know, another thing we do on Sunday. Yeah. So I would get into character. So every Sunday I would pick a character yeah. and I would be whoever I wanted to be in Sunday school. Yeah. And everybody would believe me. There's only one girl who I remember just... So through it. She was just like... Yeah. Why are you pretending? I think maybe she overheard me speaking to my mom or something <laughs> one time. And then she just, every Sunday she'd just be like... Why are you pretending? But I would pick a character. I would pick an accent. I would I would just decide my name is this, and and then eventually I, I made friends, and yeah. so now I was Patricia. You inter- yeah, you integrated. I integrated, but before that, it just was a fun thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then um, in high school, did I do any acting in high school? I don't think I did. High school was more of singing, yeah. getting into the mass choir, singing for the president, on the you know at Uhuru Park, mm-hmm. all those things, and then. In university is when I oh before university I auditioned for my first musical play. Oh yes, I was I was going to mention that Jack Rooster actually is the person who took me for my first ever audition. Is that right? Yes, way before he was Jack Rooster. Jack, way be- Jack Rooster is a very close friend to Sticks and Stones. He's a do you know he sings? He does. We know. We know this. We know a lot about Jack. <laughs> the, Jack Russo, if you're listening or watching, we know embarrassing things about you. Yo, so we used to go to the same church, yeah. and we like one time he saw me. He thought, "Oh, that's a pretty girl," uh-huh. and so he was like, you know, he'd walk me home. Church was very close yeah. to my home, <laughs> and so we so started, a short walk. <laughs> yes, and we started talking, and we got to know each other. And then one Sunday, he's like, "Yo, after church, I'm going for this audition. You should come." Mm-hmm. And I was like. Mm. What is that? Audition for what? And he's like, no, just come through. And so we went, we auditioned. We both got parts. parts, His sister also auditioned. She also got a part. But then after a couple of weeks, he pulled out. He pulled out, yeah. But then that was my introduction into musical theater. Yeah. What what production was this? I want to see if at all our research department is doing its job. Joseph and And the the amazing amazing technical technical coach. coach, Yes. Mm. You're not fired. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's, That's really good because... 
part of the conversation we are having because uh, and we were talking about this before uh we we, we started recording mm-hmm. is it was very difficult for us to get a tie in and it's always very difficult for us to get a tie in when we are recording something like this or sitting down with someone like yourself or Jim Chuchu we had mm-hmm. the previous episode is that you are doing so many different things so very well that for us to find the threads that connect it is so very difficult and so part of what we were saying was that how can we package patricia how how do we present patricia in this particular podcast and the title of this podcast which i've not even introduced mm-hmm. is nairobi vo and the reason for that is that the director of uh the show actually said for me patricia is that chick who speaks to people on all levels so patricia can speak to ambassadors in nairobi patricia can speak to traders in gikomba patricia can speak to makangas on the road patricia can speak to revelers on different scales so patricia transitions nairobi in a way that is so flawless and effortless mm-hmm. because when you think fashion you think patricia she's fashionable she's cool when you think singing when you think theater when you think acting yeah. when you think music when you think restaurant when you think uh things like well being and so he said for me patricia is what nairobi is nairobi is not always national park and feeding giraffes from your mouth and all of that and so patricia <laughs> kihoro for us was that girl and Yo. the one thing that brought this to stark reality mm-hmm. was your acting and it was your acting in a particular film called Miss Nobody mm-hmm. and uh the sound engineer Onyach saw your acting and he was like god damn is is she crying for is she acting or is she crying for real like what is happening is she okay and i was like i think she's a very good actress and it's cuz you were relatable you were so relatable it was like you're the girl next door your girlfriend your your sister your auntie wow. your uh, that chick who's going to be boarding the matatu with you or that chick who's on holiday with you and allows uh, you can borrow her sons like how do you get into that ro- how do you prepare for these roles first of all it's so interesting that that particular short piece of film mm-hmm. um was so impactful in that way because it's it's the one piece of work that I'm least proud of. Okay, I think you should maybe change your perspective <laughs> on that. Which is so strange and that's why I've never spoken about it. Mm-hmm. I was nominated for Kalasha actually because of that film. Oh. And I didn't because I didn't think that I did such a good job. Yeah. I didn't talk about it. So I didn't ask people to vote. I didn't like I just I was like I I just I I don't think I did that well. So um and it's on YouTube which is the yeah. funniest thing and it has been for what 8 years eight now years, yeah. and I just I've never spoken about it but to hear that there's people who resonated with it in that way for me it's just very moving Onyacho was crying Uongo <laughs> wow <laughs> Onyacho was crying and that's just be real Wow yeah but you know um I you know when it comes to preparing for something like that you know what I'm going to give credit to my first ever acting gig like a yeah. TV acting gig which was Changes yes which was on Mnet mm-hmm. and even the audition the audition came about because somebody came for a gig that I was singing at when I used to be in a reggae band yeah and oh we remember that one <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing that you know i just so somebody came to our first gig and then he asked me after do you act and i said yes, yes. even though i'd never yeah. been on tv as well <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. okay so they were having an audition for this show on this day come through and then uh, it was maybe like 2 weeks and in those 2 weeks i was like should i go should i not should i go should i not should i go so even on the day i was like oh, are we going and then i was like i have nothing to lose yeah the role I was auditioning for was a minor role it was like a supporting yeah, role yeah supporting role yeah um a house girl and i read the script i did the read and they were like okay cool then i asked them can i do it again, again but yeah. i i want to do it in character yeah. like a different character and i think that's where my proka character was born yeah 
and I did it in now that way with an yeah. accent from Meru and da da da, and they were like, "Oh, fantastic! Yeah, that's that's what we want." A few weeks later, they called me and they told me, "Okay, so the role that you auditioned for, mm-hmm. um, so you didn't get that, yeah, but, but we're going to offer you another role, a more major major role, role. yeah, yeah." And so. Getting into TV acting, the first season, we shot it in three months. It was great. But for the second season, they brought in an acting coach yes. from L.A. Yeah. And we went to Naivasha mm-hmm. for like from Saturday to the next Sunday. Yeah. So a whole so week. So a whole and week some. and a day. Yeah. And every day we would have these sessions with that acting coach. And the thing that stood out for me is that we were doing this kind of acting called Meisner acting. Yes, yes. Where it's different from method acting. Method acting, acting yeah. Meisner acting, the the premise of it is really just being. Mm. Don't, it's about finding the character in, in you, you. Rather than Channeling becoming it, yes. the character. Yes. And so the exercises were just very strong on us sitting, facing each other and reacting to each other rather than acting. acting yeah and that stuck with me i think nice so when it comes to preparing for roles now mm-hmm. it's less about becoming the character mm-hmm. and more about who is this character within, within me you. that i can bring out i think that's that's great advice and i always like to feel that as actors or as creatives it's very important that we are able to create an empathetic perspective because that allows us to feel that from within. And the question that this segues into is actually, last year a film comes out, uh, Rafiki. Amazing film, uh, very well done everyone. Sam, everyone, thank you very much for whatever you did in, in that film, it was very well done. And Patricia was also in there acting as Josephine, if I remember correctly. Now, yes. it was a very controversial film mm-hmm. in Kenya. Yes. And it took the intervention of the high court to have it screened in Kenya for a week so that it could be nominated for uh, the Oscars. Mm-hmm. What is the role of creatives in being able to agitate for more equality, more tolerance, but more than that, being able to try and speak and use our voices in expressing ideas that try and be more inclusive. What is the role of creatives in doing this? And do you take these roles with that in mind? So I feel, and it's, I think it's something that's, that's known, yeah. that um, theater, film, whatever it is that is done on stage or performed is, is a reflection of society. Mm-hmm. It's really just for us to see ourselves. Ourselves, yeah. Right? And um, it's so interesting that when the film came out, and it was not even last year, it was two years ago. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Time flies by very quickly. It's this COVID business. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was two years ago when it came out. And initially, the CEO of the Film Commission, yes, the, he was very vocal about how the film was a, such a true reflection of what's happening in society. He really praised Wanori for her capability to just take something that's happening. And he was like, we shouldn't bury our heads in the sand. It's it's such a beautiful, it's such a wonderful way for us to see yeah. the things that are happening. And I really resonated with the things that he was saying at that point. Mm-hmm. And I think that is what the film is about. First of all, It's based on a book, an already existing book Mm -hmm. that was written by a Ugandan writer. And it had won the Kane Prize Prize, for literature. Um, I forget her first name, but her surname is uh, Rak Denyeko. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was already an existing book. And so Wanuri just adapted it. And I know she'd been working on it for years and years and years. Um, And the thing is, it really is, it's, you know, I think because of everything that happened around it, yeah. people expected it to be this pornographic, graphic, very explicit type. When really that's not what, what it was. Yeah. And my character was, the, was playing the role of, um, I was the new wife yes. of the father of one of the girls. Yes. 
So Jimmy Gatho was my husband. Oh. Which, wow, yeah. let me tell you, when you grow up watching somebody who's an adult, yeah. then you grow up and now you become, become old enough wife. to be the wife. That is when you know you have... You are older. <laughs> <laughs> you are no longer a youth. <laughs> wow. Use them. Mm. And so there was politics as yes. well. There was so many other things um, being reflected in this film. Mm -hmm. um, so many different arcs and so many different narratives. And it was such a true reflection of, of Nairobi, of Nairobi and, and yes. just one facet of it. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that was being agitated for, even with the court case and yeah. everything, was just freedom of expression yes. and allowing creatives to be able to express themselves and to reflect society in a way that is truthful and real yes. because we can't just sit down and think that my story is the only, is the only story. story. Yeah. Or it's the only truth. Or it's the only truth. Yeah. There's so many people living so many different experiences yes. and these artists and creatives in every single sphere. Yeah. And if every single one of that artist has the freedom to tell the story, the story that they of where they're from yeah. or what they're experiencing, then I feel like we're going to have such a rich culture of tolerance and acceptance mm -hmm. because I might see something that you create and because it's your truth, it wasn't something that I had experienced, yeah. it will expand my scope yes. of what, oh wow. That's true. So this is a version of your, like the, this is the very same Nairobi that I'm living in because also for you to say that, okay, Patricia is an embodiment of Nairobi, but the truth is it's the Nairobi that I live in, yes. right? And there's also other Another people Nairobi, who yeah are embodiments of a Nairobi that they exist in that's different that's from different mine. That's different from yours, yeah. But they're all true and they're all real. So I think that for us as creatives to fight for that right to be able to express ourselves mm -hmm. truly, authentically, and just freely would be so great. And I, that's that's really just what Wanuri was, Wanuri was trying for. to do, yeah. yeah. I think for those of you who've not watched the film, it's called Rafiki. Mm -hmm. uh, it's explores a relationship between two ladies. Um, I, I, I can't do en enough justice. You should just go out there, try and find it and watch it um, illegally, but do it. You're already <laughs> doing other illegal things. Patricia, uh, mm. I want to switch gears now and go to the first time that I had you on radio. Uh, we had not met by then. I know you're still waiting for when <laughs> I'll tell the story of how you and I met, yeah. but I'm driving along on Mombasa Road and uh, this is the news. I'm Patricia Kihoro. I'm like, which Patricia Kihoro? And it turns out that you were on radio reading the news. And I was like, this woman is everywhere. <laughs> this woman is everywhere. I go on stage. She's there. I'm looking at TV, films. I'm listening to music. She's there. How did you get into radio? Because I'm not sure which came first. And this is funny because you were reading the news and then you hosted a show that we really liked. Afro Central. And the reason we liked it is that at some point we were all DJs. Like we used to make music. Some, some of us still do. I no longer do it because mm -hmm. these people say I have poor tastes. But we were listening to Jack Rooster's show, uh, Cafe Mocha. And then we'd listen to your show and steal the music that you were playing, basically go out there and then put it into our mixes. Mm -hmm. So how did Patricia Kihoro go from reading the news, because I was shocked. I almost rained people over. <laughs> wow. <laughs> from reading the news yeah. into now hosting a show that was basically very Afrocentric. Mm. Yes. So I, I started reading the news in 2010. Yes. And it was at 1FM. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well done. <laughs> like research department, you're outdoing <laughs> yourselves this time. And the, first of all, 1FM, when I'd heard about 1FM... Mm -hmm. The word going around was that, oh, there's this new station that's coming up that's going to be playing only African, African music. music yes. And I was like, sign me up. Where? Who do I speak to? Like, you know, like I was mm -hmm. ready. Mm -hmm. And the only person I knew at the time who I had heard was involved was Adele. Yes. Onyango. Onyango, yes. And she was in training. Now they were training to 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 do the shows. Yeah. And I remember reaching out to her and I'm like, yo, so who do I speak to? Put me in touch. Like, I really just need to be part of it. Yeah. And um, I think she put, she told me Piera is involved. Yes. I was like, Piera McKenna? Yeah. Piera and I had done changes together. Yeah. 
So I reach out to Pierre. And Pierre is like, okay, you just come through for a voice test. Mm -hmm. So I go for a voice test for a show, right? And then they tell me, we're only going to be starting with two shows. That's breakfast and drive. And drive, yeah. So unfortunately, you know, we're not yes. doing any other shows. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so what What's can that? I do now? Yeah. Because if I go home to wait for you guys to tell me, <laughs> at a, you'll call me when you're ready. Yeah. I might wait forever. That's a Kenyan thing though. It's like, Acha niende kwa mpesa, unafunga sangapi, that's me all the time. Exactly. Yeah. So they said, well, we need a news anchor. I was like, I will okay. do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, I told them, let me come back tomorrow for the voice test for the voice for test news. For the news yeah. I went home, found newspapers. I was like, I have to practice the way people read the news. So I'm yeah. listening to news anchors, I'm watching the news, and I'm like, okay, the intonation and everything. Projection, oh, everything, yeah. I practiced. <laughs> Went back the next day, did the voice test, and they're like, okay, that is great. You have done well. We will let you know. Oh, and then they called me. I remember the day Piera called me, actually. It was sometime in August. Um of 2010, yeah. I was at a funeral. My grandma had just passed. And she was like, yeah, so you got the job. I was like, I'm at a funeral. Thank you. Awesome. You can't do a dance. Yeah, like, I can't be like, because at the same time, it's <laughs> sad, yeah. honestly, like truly. Um, and so we started in September. I joined the, well, I didn't join a news desk. I was the news you desk. You are the news desk. Right. So <laughs> I was re basically responsible for everything. But what one thing I was grateful for is that there were three interns, mm -hmm. um, two two gentlemen and a lady. The lady was Asha Mwilu. Ooh. Yes. So she was, I, I mean, her and I vibed immediately. So there was Asha, there was John, and there was what, the other guy who, unfortunately, I don't remember his name. And so I told them, you guys are going to teach me everything about the news because I haven't I have studied no idea, yeah. journalism, nothing. So you guys are going to, like, I'm here to learn from you. Yeah. And so they taught me especially Asha, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Asha and I would sit next to each other and she taught me, you know, journalism basics. Yeah. Uh, it was just, just one -on -one. everything. So even when they'd go out to the field to look for stories, they yeah. would text me. She taught me about scripting. So I learned how to script. By the time we were going live, mm -hmm. we kind of had a flow. So day one, I was pre-recording the news yeah. and I didn't like it. I was like, I, it doesn't sound right. Can I just do it live? I don't like yeah. hearing the sound of my voice. <laughs> so by the end of that day, I was doing the news, the news live, live. Yeah, and that that was my life for two years. Were you tempted at any point? Because I know you didn't want to do the news. You wanted to play African music. At some point, were you attempted to say? And in other news, ten trucks crashed in Likoni, but chicken, chicken, chicken. <laughs> Here is <laughs> Fenagitu's twenty kazi or something. No. Oh, so I, I took my job very seriously. But the thing that people didn't see was that, you know, right before the news, I was dancing. Sometimes I would be like trying to catch my breath so that I start reading the news. <laughs> Sometimes you'd have really funny stories yeah. and I'd be laughing when the clips are playing. It was really fun. I read the news. I was a news anchor for two years, but every month I was just like, so this show, when is this when happening? are we doing yeah. this? Um, and so in 2012, I left, I took, they, they granted me um, a six-month hiatus because by the time I was leaving, Olivia Otieno was, was our program was, was controller. Program controller yeah. And before I left, I, I pitched her the ideas I had for the shows I wanted to do. And she yeah. was like, these are great. So you go, I was going on tour for this show that we did in Europe. In Europe, yeah, yeah. And she said, you go do your thing. Take as much time as you need. When you come back, we'll be here. But I'm also acknowledging that you might go out there and, yeah, and find, find something better. Things, yeah. But just know that if you do come back and you want to come back here, we we're here. These things. So I left for Europe, came back in December, still wanted to get back to do my show, mm -hmm. the show which was playing the music that I wanted to play. Yeah. I, I really just, I used to think of myself as I want to do what Nini Washera used to do with Late Night with Radio, late night, yeah. but now with just African music. Yeah. African I, I love Nini Washera. She's like, yeah. even as a person, she's like, so I'm always very intimidated when I sit close to people like yourself and Nini Washera and all, basically everyone, because there's a level of cool that I don't think in my lifetime I'll ever achieve. You guys are just like... Mm. I think you think too hard about it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not walking around thinking... Yeah, cool. No, no, you just do it. That's what I'm saying. You <laughs> just like 
Yeah. There's people who look at you who think you're cool. First no. of all, like if only your nyach thinks that because I beat if, him at FIFA. No, 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 no. <laughs> if I could walk around knowing I can make things like this, ah, my goodness, nobody would tell me anything. Uh, trust me, this does not pay a lot. Like I've had people who make me do things like this and then go back and say, "Oh, this is too dark. Can you change this?" And I've worked on it for like six weeks. <laughs> I know. I know anyway, uh, Afro Central now. Yes. So yeah. I uh, when I went back to One FM, mm-hmm. unfortunately Olivia wasn't Olivia there wasn't anymore. There anymore yeah. She had the, moved to I, don't I think Radio I don't Africa. Know. Yeah. But the person that I found basically said that no, there's no room for your shows. Can you do a hits show? Dry, like a rush hour. Like a rush hour, yeah. And I was like, no. But honestly, the content of my show is so is so reliant on the music that I play yeah. that playing hits that are playing on other radio stations really doesn't, doesn't make for sense. Me. Yeah. So I left one FM. Mm-hmm. That was me. That was me saying, you know what, I'm just gonna walk away. I don't know what's gonna pay my rent, but, but I just don't want to be I here. Go. Yeah. So that was January of 2013. But you know, luckily there was work, there was film. I think that's the year I also, we filmed Homecoming, Homecoming with Jim. Yes. Later that year, Jim, uh, Jack Rooster invited me to his show, Cafe yeah, Mocha, Mocha, on yeah, a yeah, Sunday. Yes. I we actually remember out. that. I just remember that because Jack Rooster, at that particular time, we were doing lots of 6 a.m. events. Right. And so we were talking to Jack Rooster and mm-hmm. he was like, yo, do you guys want to come and hang out at the studio? And yes, I was like, yeah, exactly he's, that's that what thing. he used to do. So I went to hang out and then he's like, I have this poem that I want you to read mm-hmm. as I play this yes. music <laughs> as a bed. Yeah. And so I read the poem and John Rabat just happened to, happened be, in to be in the studio that day. Yes. So he heard me and he told Della Mbaya, mm-hmm. I think we can get her on the news desk. So Della Mbaya calls me and I'm just like, I see. Mambo ya news, Mimi apana. News apana. And she so she was just incessant. She's yeah. like, just come in for a conversation. This is like October. Yeah. And she kept calling. I think I went in maybe December. Yeah. She's like, just come in for a conversation. So I went in. I had a conversation with John. And he's like, yeah, I would really like for you to join yeah. our news desk. And I was like, hmm. Again. You know what? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is what I wish. I mean, this is what I want. I want to do. Yeah. I want a show. I want to play this kind of music. So yeah. if you can give me that kind of show, I'll read you. Then news. I'll read your news. And he was like, "Yeah, yeah we actually fine. have. Yeah. We have a, a vacancy. We have a slot. Saturdays, one to three. Is yeah. it cool?" I was like, yes, "Yes, it's cool." So, actually, no, that wasn't even December. That was January. Mm-hmm. So I started in Feb. No, I started in January reading the news, and then February 1st was the date of my first Afro Central show. Nice, yeah. And I did the news and Afro Central for about six months. Mm-hmm. And after six months, I remember telling John, I need yes, news. news in a, in a kichwa, tafadali. Please, please, I, I, I don't, yeah. have mercy on me. I can't do it. And he was like, yeah, oh, okay. I kind of was yeah. expecting this. <laughs> and then I said, if you if you want to take the show, it's okay, it's fine, but I just yeah. can't keep doing the news. He's like, no, 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 you, you keep, keep the, the show. show but yeah. tutakata mshahara, we'll cut so your course. salary. Yeah, but, yeah. And I was like, yo, it's cool. John is very is very astute like that. Like, yeah. on, on, we've, we've dealt with him on other things. He's very, I like that he's very astute. He's mm-hmm. like firm, but fair. Yeah. And that, that was amazing. And the first time that I had one of like my favorite... African artist was actually on your show. You played Bemba Mba by Richard Bona. Mm. I don't even know if you remember that, but then <laughs> I was I was listening. Um, I was a wild youth at that particular time. Oh, that yeah? music used to calm me down. So I was yeah. driving a super fast uh, sports car at that mm. time in Nairobi, but then blasting Richard Bona. So wow. thank you so much for being steadfast and saying no to the news. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we can now move on to the question that also intrigues me because we are also in comedy you and jason runo and a few other people jason was actually here two weeks ago two weeks ago delivering honey jason shout out to you with like amazing honey he's hosting a dinner uh dining with the bees to tomorrow yeah yes i'm going for that you're going for that yeah yeah Yeah. we we wanted to go for that but the slots were all booked oh wow yeah Yeah. and and you're like jason you know us and you say yeah yeah that's why that's why i wouldn't give you (laughs) so you and jason runo have an improv comedy troupe Mm -hmm. uh because you said so yes 
Patricia, how did you get into comedy? You already, or you, have, you can only tell she's a funny person, but how did you get into improv comedy? Because it's one of the most difficult types of comedy since you're taking suggestions from people and you have people like myself who are mm-hmm. somewhere on the scale. Mm-hmm. So if you tell me, give me a suggestion about uh, a day in your work. I'm like, you are a nuclear reactor engineer mm-hmm. at uh, Silo 17 in Ukraine. <laughs> Go. <It's> like, <laughs> How how did you get into improv comedy? Why improv? It's so funny because I don't even think we knew of it as improv when we were doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so before, because you said so, yeah. in November of 2013, I did a show called Life in the Single Lane. Oh, yes. And how that came about, uh, we'd been doing groove theory on Zuku. Mm-hmm. Zuku, yeah. Mm. And it's a musical TV show. And the, one of the writers and the producer were married, husband and wife. And at the time, I was seeing a guy who used to really stress my life. Okay. So the producer... No shout out to you, guy. <laughs> <laughs> and the producer, her name is Daisy. She Like, she, she's such a loving, caring, warm person. So she'd ask me, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh my goodness. Yes, man. And her and her husband used to do these plays yeah. on marriage. Um, so after we shot Groove Theory, the two of them reached out to me and they're like, we're thinking about doing a show about a single mm. person. We've been doing these shows about Marge, married couples, yeah. but we want to do one on being single. And so if you could just meet with us every once in a while and tell us what you're going through and then we'll write but something. Patricia, you were not single. So <laughs> they broke you up. It's like, we are thinking See, of doing Elisa, a show Elisa. with a single person. I was, I was single in the sense that I wasn't married. Oh, oh, oh I thought like, so yeah, dating. let's break these people up no, no, so no, that no, we no, can no, have no, a show. No, 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 no. Like I was, so I wasn't married. So they wrote something. Mm-hmm. Husband wrote something. His name is Seth. It's mm-hmm. a brilliant, brilliant um, writer. And when we started rehearsals, I just wasn't connecting with the, the character, the play, yeah. and it just didn't feel like no, like, like I wasn't just yeah. I wasn't seeing it. Was it was not clicking. Yeah. yeah. And when I saw the poster that they designed, I was like, "This is a beautiful poster, but, but it just has my face." Yeah. So people were thinking, "Oh, Patricia is launching an album, <laughs> or it's Patricia's show, it's Patricia's something." She's and going to be reading the news live. At a theater. Right. And so people were reaching out. They're like, oh, my God, what is this? Like, are you finally, like, you know, putting out music? Is it a concert? And I was like, oh, gosh. So I told them, yo, I think what we're communicating is not the same as what What we're preparing. preparing, And I asked them if we could sort of just scrap that. So this was on a Monday or Tuesday that I was having this conversation with them. The show was on Friday. It's Friday, yeah. And I was like, guys, I I just don't feel it. I think we should scrap it, either postpone or Mm -hmm. change it. Redo it, it, yeah. And they're like, okay, we can't postpone it. So let's work with what you feel we should do. So I was like, okay, the only person I can think of calling right now is Jason Runo. He's the only person who I feel like would just roll Roll with it. And it fits as well. Like he looks, the person that they had cast as my boyfriend in the play looked yeah. like my father he looked a lot older than me yeah. so it, it for me it also didn't feel believable so i was like jason is the only person i th- i can think of right yeah. now i called jason i was like jason i have a show this friday i want you to be a part of it are you available yes, yes. this is jason this is typical like i like how gang-ho jason is he is like yeah yeah, yeah yeah so as i was sitting and thinking okay what can i do i was like what if i told different stories about dating in nairobi mm-hmm. And then because I, you know, I like to act, I can act it out. out, And then because I like to sing, I can can sing sing a song about it. And so that's how it developed. So now we then sat down. So Jason came to my house and we're like, so what different scenarios can we do? Okay, Tunesa Fanya. Ah, okay, Msani, Msani. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so one dude is a broke artist. Yeah. Like a rich dude, a rich dude, but he's older, but like he's he's rich, but he's like not Nairobi yeah. or Kisawa, another one. Um, We can do the blankets and wine guy. Yeah. yeah, you know, the cool dude who, nah, 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 nah. and then we can do it like this. There was no script. Yes. It was just writing down. It was okay. on the fly. Blankets, this is the character. Blankets yeah. one, blankets two, artist. Uh, rich guy. Rich guy. Like we just wrote down, <laughs> I think it came to about 10 scenarios. Yes. And then for each of them, even Jason would be like, ah, there's this new John Legend song. Eh? Mm-hmm. It's so nice. I bet we think of a scenario to do with that. So like it was just very know. collaborative. Yeah. And then we sat down with Seth and we're like, so this is how we want to do it. So 
on the Thursdays when we were like, so we are thinking like this, like this. They're like, okay, cool, okay, easy. Let's go with it. Friday, I remember the text I sent guys. I was like, guys, just come through. It's an experiment, um, but come. It was at Michael Joseph Center. Yeah. So I think that's where the element of improv for Life in the Single Lane came from because there was no script. Mm -hmm. It was just me on stage with Jason. Jason we yeah. know the scenarios. We know the music. So it's just, okay, so for the guy I meet at church. This is the music. This, this is the Yeah, scenario. and then we're going to act like, so when I'm in the restaurant, maybe when I order something, I'll say I want a single. Yeah. So that it's like that a is single. A, a, yeah. Then I'll turn to the audience and I'll ask them, should I, should I? So it was yeah. interactive in that way as well. Yeah. So we did that show in November of 2013. Did it twice because mm -hmm. the first time it sold out. Yes. And I was like, oh, some people were sent w home. Were sent home, yeah. So we did a second time for those guys, but they came and brought their, their friends. friends. And guys yeah. who watched it the first time came with their friends. So I did it a third time in December. That's a good problem to have. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> in December, I did it, but Jason wasn't around. Wasn't around, yeah. He did that motorcycle bike, bike trip. Him, yeah, yeah, to yeah. SA. So I was like, since Jason is not around, let me call my other friends. Mm -hmm. But because I felt like I didn't, I, I needed to to take the ticket price to a thousand yes. bob. But so let like, me give them more value. More value, yeah. So I had now my four friends: K1, mm -hmm. Njora, Yafesi, Mugash. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, playing the different scenarios. So by the time we, now Jason had the brilliant idea for us to do our improv, improv show, show yeah. he had had a conversation with Mugash yeah. and it was really just based on, now it was his own creation, yeah. right? And him and Mugash then sat down and were like, okay, cool, this sounds like something amazing we can do. Who can we do it with? with yeah. And so they just listed names, ah, June, ah, Yafesi, Patricia. Patricia, yeah. And the thing is, we're all friends. Yes. And we're all friends who have hung out and sat down with each other yeah. and just been silly, stupid, foolish together severally yeah like that is that is how so there's already are. there's already a, a, a sort of connection that already yes. puts you together yeah. we already trust each other yes. we already know each other yeah. we already know you can feed off each other that's the thing yeah exactly yeah so just in the same way for life in the single and i was like jason is the only person, person i can think can get, of yeah that's how I, I I would imagine it BYSS. like byss grew out of a thing where it wasn't that we were good, good at improv uh, yeah. comedy no, it but was you more were like good enough friends, we're friends yeah. who goof off together. Goof off together so yeah. when why not do it on so stage? So the foolishness just keeps growing when you're together. Exactly. I think that's the same thing I experienced with like my friends here. Yeah, is sometimes my girlfriend is just like, I can't believe I'm going to marry this man. Uh, <laughs> As it should be. As I, it should I, I be. hope so. I hope she doesn't change her mind. <laughs> Patricia. Yeah. One thing that we're realizing and one thing we're trying to understand is privilege. And the one thing with privilege is just being able to sit down and listen. Mm. As men, as a man, as a black man, it's important for me to listen. As a black man who is in a certain socioeconomic status, it's important for me to just sit and listen. That's the mm. first thing that privilege does. Mm. You're a woman who's navigating all these industries that are mostly male dominated. Yeah. What has this experience been for you as a woman? Because it's not easy. And for, for us, and, and the more I listen, the more I learn just how many barriers there are for women. What has this experience of being on radio, being on stage, trying to sing, like all of these things, being in, 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 in uh, competitions for singing, mm. what has this experience been for you as a woman? I think because I've only ever navigated the world as a woman, yes. I don't know any different. Yeah. So I do know, I can see the privilege that men enjoy. Yes. But because I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up thinking that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, an, I, I'm, I'm already at a disadvantage. Yeah. So for me, I was just living my life as I knew it. And mm -hmm. then I came to learn about the spaces in which I might have been a disadvantage because yeah. I was a woman. But I've never, I also see the privilege that I've had, had in yeah. growing up in the way that I have, yeah. in the spaces that I've occupied, in, you know, I've been able to access people that that not, some people may not that be some able to access. People yeah. may not be able to access. So even in, in understanding the privilege that men have, mm -hmm. I've, I've also grown up knowing that I enjoy 
a huge level of privilege just based on you know what my parents were able to create yes. for me and my siblings yeah. the life that we've been able to live which also it's not like we grew up rich you know yes. I grew up in buruburu but that was better than something Some, else something else yeah. um i was able to go to high school i was able to go to university, university yeah. You know, even though there were some times when I I could see that my folks were really really working hard yeah. to be able to afford to pay, um, for something that you know, looking back now, is yeah. You know what I, I know. mean. I know what you mean. But then, so I've never really looked at myself as having to fight for anything because I think maybe I just wasn't keen. Mm-hmm. I wasn't walking around. As a child I was just like I wish I was born a boy. I wish I was born a boy because boys would get away with so, so much. much, yeah. With so much and that that's when I was like I wish I was a boy. Um and and just because of, you know, being told that girls do this, girls look like this, girls don't do this. Yeah. But luckily my folks loved me loved as a yeah. as a as a tomboy tomboy yeah <laughs> i know I, I, I fashion icon you called me fashion icon we are actually oh. going to hop on to that question like next Let because me tell you something <laughs> ah, ah. i was in t-shirts biker shorts tiny shorts short skirts like i was in what was convenient for me to be able to try and, and, and ride yeah. bicycles and things i i, I never thought of myself as a but like a young even my mom used to complain all the time she's like i wish i had a girly girl so that i could put things in your hair but you just want to play and you have scars and my dad would say hey you know to be a model you can't have scars yeah. and i had by age 4 i had scars <laughs> even on my head i would come home because i was playing with boys with rings <laughs> at each other and i have a cut above my eye because a stone landed right here i could have gouged out my eye um so i I I I never I'm glad that I grew up in a household where the roles were not necessarily that my mom is the one who yeah. was in the kitchen my dad was in the kitchen more than any of my relatives combined right because my dad loved to cook until today he loves to loves cook, cook. Yeah. and that's what his career is about he's in the hospitality industry yeah. and so I grew up knowing that I don't have to just because I'm a girl yeah you that's- know There was times when my dad after he got out of employment and was running his own business you know when like the 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 lady who like our house manager yeah. she doesn't come back home from christmas on time yeah. but my mom has to go back to work yeah. and my dad would stay home and i remember cleaning the house with him um wiping the floors and you know my dad was never you know he, he didn't hold on to that toxic Tradition, masculinity yes, yes. in that way So I had the privilege of growing up in that. I I think part of and that's beautiful because part of what we were discussing with Jim last time was mm. that a lot of times toxic masculinity tells you what you cannot do. It does not tell you what you should be doing. Mm. And so I think the lesson for me especially from this and it's very encouraging is that especially as men we should be able to allow ourselves to be in a space that encourages the women in our lives to ideally be able to pursue anything and everything that they want. Yeah. And and that for me is always a very important lesson in terms of parity, yes. in terms of creating a platform of equality, mm-hmm. but also the one thing I love and we're going to speak about this later on is being able to use our voices to project and basically speak for those people who are not able to do that mm-hmm. so it is my duty as a man to be able to speak against certain injustices especially with my friends mm-hmm. if someone says something misogynistic mm-hmm. it's not enough for me to just shut up or or say oh he's just that way it's mm-hmm. important for me to be able to correct him and tell him and say no yeah. that's not the way that should be but more than that also i think one approach that we should be able to have in creating equality parity is to be able to educate a lot of times this comes from you find that these prejudices came from a place of ignorance mm. and in this day and age you cannot claim ignorance yeah. it's it's all over yeah okay let's talk about something a bit more fun now mm-hmm. um 
There's a picture that we forgot to load up onto the screen, but we'll share with you. We stole it from your Instagram. Mm-hmm. It's you wearing sandak shoes and socks on a bicycle with your dad. Hey. Uh, you're wearing track suits. I just want to say you are ahead of your time because that's what the youth men out there are wearing <laughs> right now. Patricia, a lot of times people use fashion to manifest who they are, their personality, mm-hmm. and bring that out. And so two days ago, I was researching uh, this particular episode uh, about you, and I was going through pictures on uh, Instagram and everything. And my girlfriend walked in on me and said, are you stalking beautiful women on the Instagram? <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm stalking one particular beautiful woman on the Instagram. Mm-hmm. How have you, and I've seen this a lot, how have you used your platform to be able to push forward the idea of what modern African fashion is. Because for a lot of people, when we say African fashion, they always think, oh, Kitengas, mm. and they're thinking like old uh, mm-hmm. type, like the, the things our mothers wore, like yeah. big, big, like not sexy or whatever. It's very flat and out there. Whew. Fashion icon, Patricia Kihoro. <laughs> Give us your wisdom. <laughs> I think I came to understand a while back Mm -hmm. that, you know, we can't really put ourselves in a box and say that African Mm -hmm. is just the Kitenge and the Ankara. Yes. (laughs) Because a lot of people would do that. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, and it's basically just because of the people that I have had the privilege of meeting Mm -hmm. and having in close proximity. Yeah. Somebody like Sunny Dolat. Sunny Dolat, yes. So much from him. We have Sunny Dolat's uh, book. contribution book here, yeah. not African enough. Please, guys, go out, have a look at it. We're going to put a link yeah. uh, in the description here. Sunny Dolat, big shout out to you, bro. Yes, I bought that as soon as it came out. I, yes. I remember I bought it. Well, maybe it wasn't as soon as it came out, but when we were filming another series of yeah. uh, films with the Nest, yeah. um, I saw I saw the book. I was like, I have to have it. Because Sunny was styling it. And yeah. I've learned so much from Sunny when he's always explaining or sharing about African fashion. Yes. Um, so, you know, whenever he's taking, like just recently, he was talking about all the flack that he's received over the years when he was styling Saudi Soul. Yeah. And, you know, the comments that people would say that this is it's not just African, Westernized. this is Westernized. Meanwhile, yes. Sunny has actually just taken elements of African fashion. Yeah. Into the and then he gave his receipts. He's like, "This is from this community, and this is from." Yeah. And when I initially, I I love Kitenge fabric. Yes. I've loved it for a very long time, and I don't think it's going to stop. But I, I moved from feeling like when I'm traveling, yeah. I have to have to something, have something made yes. out of it so that people know that I'm African. Yeah. So that I say this is African fashion. Um. Because I, I, I've loved Maasai Market for a long time. So w- when it came to jewelry, I was always doing Maasai Market yeah. and Kikoi's around my neck and yeah. Lesos around my neck. And so people knew me for that from way back when. Yeah. And so as I grew and I, I had a bit of spending power, I would yeah. start to put back to Kenyan designers yeah. or Kenyan jewelry makers and because I feel and strongly believe that we have such amazing we do. artists. We do. Right? And so learning to move from something is African because it looks, looks African, African yeah. to something is African because, because it's, it's from, from here. Africa and it's made by us. And it's made by us. Yeah. Right? So like today, everything I have on except my shoes is made in Kenya. Take us through this. Take us through <laughs> this look. Now I feel like I'm on Vogue. Take us through this look, Patricia. And and, and I, I love it when people say, oh my God, you mean that's Kenyan? Yeah. It looks so great. Or with music, with music Afro yes. Central. That's a Kenyan artist. Oh my God, it's so great. This is, so this is a young girl called Sadie Kamochu. Mm-hmm. This is brass. I love brass. We're going to link everything that Patricia is wearing. Uh, <laughs> seal the look. I think that's what the youth men are calling it in the streets. Is that it? Yeah. Um, so ev- all, what are, all the, all, everything. Yeah. Tights, this, this, this is a felt jacket. Yes. And these are just tights and a bodysuit. These are Vivo. Vivo, yes. Which also, um, I think with Vivo, I love that. It's not necessarily something has to look African. African. She was creating clothes that it, that are comfortable, 
that are long lasting yeah. that women can wear and feel sexy yeah. and feel who and it started with the body cons yes. if i remember and the body cons were just any woman of any size would wear them and feel, feel great good. Yeah. right um and then the jewelry kipato and branded kipato and branded yes this is kawira africa oh, yeah This is Kipato and branded Kipato as well. Kipato branded as well. This is Adele de Jacques. Adele de Jacques, big shout out. Love. And you know, I've I've gotten to a point where I in fact I made when this year started I was like by the end of this year I want 90% of my wardrobe to be African. Yeah. And so that means also like making sure i prioritize how i spend. How you spend, yeah. So that I'm able to put money into these into businesses. These businesses. And so fashion I dress for comfort. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I also I I I don't know how to do that thing where you wear one thing one once. One thing once and then I don't I think that's very wasteful to be quite honest. It's not if you wear that one thing once and it's taken back and and it drives people to that designer. That designer, yeah. Yeah, so I I can understand that there's people who work with stylists yeah. and they wear one thing once but it's returned to the to the, to the, to to the, the designer. To the designer, yeah. And when they tag that they're wearing this, that designer then, that then designer gets, gets like eyeballs yeah. and gets business. That I can understand. Mm-hmm. I but I'm also just that person who doesn't if there's an event coming up The first thing I'm thinking is not what I'm going to what wear. What you going to wear? Yeah. I'm just thinking, oh, where is it going to be? Who's going to be there? We'll have fun and then the outfit thing comes later. I'm like, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. So oh, I need to be dressed. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, Patricia, you and I now I'm going back to how you and I first met. You and I first met at uh my friend's print shop, uh Samir. Nope. Ngongro. Yes. Oh, well, met in person. Met in sure. person, yes. But we've met online on several occasions as you were trying to join certain groups. Yes. Was <laughs> That's the one. And and you wrote me a very harsh email and I was like, "Listen, and But here's the funny thing. <laughs> here's the funny thing. When you're writing that uh and it was a very long complaint like, "Why are you not letting me into this group? I was actually at my mom's funeral." Oh no. And so I was like, "How could this person oh, be so?" And then no. I was very polite because I was like, Yo, listen, she doesn't know what's going on in your life. So just be easy. And I was also polite. You were very polite. But it was it was born out of a frustration yeah. because it felt like it had been six months of me trying to But, get into this group that yes. I was told was actually very simple. Mm. And my friend who had invited me yeah. was like, no, I should be able to to allow you in. I don't know why it's not letting you Yes. In. It's because we then created a vetting process because then it became so very difficult. But then your vetting at least, I think we used to get requests of at least 1,200 people a day. Really? Yes, 1,200 people a day. And this was a, a couple of years ago. So it was very, very difficult. And the people who are my co-admins, yeah. at that particular time, I think that was a very difficult period of time because they were going through a lot. Mm. And so I was also trying to take that on. I, mean, I was But, feeling like I was being profiled. But Patricia was profiling you because you're a celebrity. Oh. But it wasn't even coming as that you because know, it's no. it's honestly I it it's very it's very hard for me to see myself as a celebrity. A celebrity because I, I what is that? What does that mean? Ask these people who are here clapping when you walked in. It's like, "Hey." Because to be honest, I still have to pay the very same bills that people pay. That's true. I still have to go do my grocery shopping. Mm-hmm. I still have to deal with water. I still have to deal with electricity, like blackouts. Okay, It's not so... at my house. Hapa ni kwa celebrity steam itabaki hapo. You know what I mean? It's not like when I'm driving in traffic, it's like, ah, the celebrity is coming, uh, clear the traffic or Okay, you know, so it's... Patricia, let 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 me <laughs> spin this round we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll haggle over this uh mm-hmm. when we're having coffee after this but i reached out to very many different people to try and say okay yo listen we need to get patricia on the show mm-hmm. and so one of the people we reached out to is david masharia he's a stand up comic he's been to uh one of your shows actually several of your shows speaker box he's a uh, regular yeah shout out to david you owe me money but we'll discuss that later um <laughs> <laughs> oh wow <laughs> patricia kihoro what is speaker box it happens at k1 mm-hmm. when does it happen What happens at Speaker Box? So K1 used to happen at K1 when the world was still open. Yes. Now it <laughs> happens in, in on the internet. Um and K1 K1 actually Patricia who is one of the people who from K1. Yes. reached out to me and told me we have this space and we'd love for you to curate something. Yeah. 
around it every Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So she invited me to look at the new space. It's what used to be the soccer city. Soccer city, city yeah. And they renovated it into this beautiful space. So initially I thought she wanted me to do life in the single lane yeah. there. But really she said, no, actually we just want to do something every Wednesday. Yeah. And they, they're the ones who came up with the name, Speaker mm. Box. And so I was like, oh, wow, this is wonderful. And I said, yes. And we talked about it. We brainstormed. I thought, I was like, well, one, this would be a, a fantastic place to have um, the acoustic, acoustic nights, yeah. music where it's just unplugged. Yes. You know, at most three instruments, yeah. not live band. It had been so long since I'd heard something like that or yeah. experienced something like that. And I wanted a regular space for that. Mm-hmm. And also there was room to have speaker sessions. Yeah. There was room to have nights like open mic yeah. where people of all sorts of talents could come and present whatever they wanted. They doing, yeah. And that's how speaker box began. So they sort of just gave me a free, a hand, free hand to do whatever you to wanted. To do whatever. Yeah. And when I came up with sort of like a schedule, mm-hmm. Patricia was like, okay, this is great. And, yeah. you know, we, they, they were so open to everything I would suggest. So even to paying our yeah. artists because we we haven't we've never gotten sponsors to be honest yeah. till this day. That's that's very difficult in the city for some reason. Yeah, but we had to really talk about okay, so what are we going to pay our artists? Initially, what they they thought was a good rate because yeah. they were basing it on what they pay the live band. Yeah. But like, well, the live band is this number of people, so. We were thinking because it's one person, we can just pay this. I was like, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. We're paying them for their talent and the show and this. So I think this would be a good amount. They were so open. They're like, okay, great. That makes sense. I also was of the thought that I don't want to ask people to come do this for free. For free, yeah. For exposure. Yeah. No. Even though they're not as well known, their talent is what we are paying for. Mm -hmm. And for them to take the time to come and bless us with their they amazing haven't. music, they still deserve to be paid a rate that is significant. Is, is livable, yeah. Yeah, but also I was able to then also say, you know, the reason, it's not a significant amount, yes. but we're also asking that you don't come with too many too people. Too many people, so that it yeah. So it also makes sense well. for you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the speaker sessions, we also sit in a bathtub. Shout out to bathtubs <laughs> across the world. Yeah. So this is not the first time Patricia has been in a bathtub <laughs> with a stranger. I'm very, very, very well versed with sitting in a bathtub. Yes. Yeah. You had it here first. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, inviting people who are creative mm-hmm. from various creative spheres yes. like Trude Slinger who's a photographer yes. we've had Mudoni DQ not yes. as a performer but speaking to us as a curator, curator of, of arts yes curator and creator yes of events um she's so larger than life yeah she's the largest <laughs> of, of all lives. of all lives yes and we went to high school together you did yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Th- that's what that's why I keep saying Nairobi is <laughs> Two degrees of separation because mm-hmm. every every time you reach out your hand, there's someone who knows. So it's like, yeah. oh, I went to school with that person. Yeah. Oh, that person owes me money. Oh, yeah. like yeah, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So we've had wonderful people grace um, our bathtub, yeah. the book bunk. Yes. Uh, Wanori. Yes. Uh, we've had artists like we've had artists who are not mainstream but some that are well known and have been in the industry for yes. a while and others who are young yeah. so if you think about it somebody like Harry Kimani has yes, speaker yes, box. yes 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 Somebody like Jun Gashui, Eric Wainaina. Yeah. But also we have people like Kato Change, who's like... Kato is... Anajulikana, but ni muyang, lakini ni mdop. Did you know that he spent about two years in Brazil? He's still there. He's still there? Si amekuwa mauko corona. Oh, yeah. Because, so we have... So here's the thing. We have a thing called Shanghai to Shangri-La. This space is called Shangri-La. Okay. So Shanghai to Shangri-La is basically something similar to what you're doing but mm-hmm. this is all uh on youtube basically okay. so one one instrument uh maybe a guitarist a pianist or mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. and one vocalist mm-hmm. and they sit and they do their thing yeah so we, we we thought of this idea about six years ago and we were talking we were talking with Kato Changi, and he was like yo listen i'm going to brazil so as soon as i get back let's do this mm-hmm. but then we also do so many different things that yeah. that was not able to happen yeah. so when we were trying to get uh, the guitarist, because already we have an idea for the vocalist we want to feature in the very first one, when we started calling, like we called Tom, we called Ricky, we called different people, I was like, mm. let me call Kato. And I was like, his phone is not going through. His phone is not going through. 
Now I know why his phone is not going through. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah. Uh, Kato, we hope you come him. home at some point. But you can DM him. He's on IG. He's just to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, like the artists that we've had at Speaker Box, yeah. younger ones like Xenia, like yes, Lisa Zinia. Noah, yes. like Njoki Karu, yeah. um, Tetushani, who's older, but... but I mean, he's not, he's, he's not, people are, are loving him now, but, but he's, he's been, been doing there. it for yes, a while and yes, he's yes, so yes. skilled. Our first ever artist was Shiano Maimba, yeah, Maimba yes. who's an amazing singer, songwriter and guitar, and guitar player. But he also plays other instruments. Did you know this? I think he plays the, what's the eight string one? Uh, there's, there's an eight string traditional African instrument. I can't remember the name, but he plays Nyatiti. that. Nyatiti? Yes. Wandindi? I, one of those. <laughs> It has an uh, E in it. Or Rutu, which one? Yes. <laughs> he, he plays one of those. Right. But yeah. I think speaker box is very amazing. I've, I've attended, you. I think, three speaker boxes because then uh, I, I'm basically part of the crowd. So mm -hmm. I come in and I sit and I see different comics do it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, that has been very encouraging to see because sometimes I, you just want to be, even as a person who does the arts, you also mm. want to enjoy the arts. Yes. And so that has been a great thing for me. It felt like me curating my faves yeah. or just people that I want to explore, to discover yeah. in my space. Yeah. Because all, Open Mic as well, Yes. it grew into this, I didn't think comedy. Comedy would yeah. go, go yeah. into it, yeah. But when Akina Ribia and Ribia, it started Lee, to come, yeah. I was just like, I love this. And also discovering artists who take the open mic seriously. Seriously, yes. And they come with instruments, with a band, with dancers. We've had yeah. dancers come and yeah, perform. Yeah. I love, I love what Speaker Box has grown into. And I hope it's the kind of thing that can, that continue, can continue even, 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 even if you're I'm not, not there. there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's always good when art takes a life of its own mm -hmm. and keeps going. I want us to talk about travel, your travel blog as well. All sorts. Or you're a traveler, let's call it that. Yes. <laughs> yes. You're a traveler. And for me, it's not really about the travel. The mm -hmm. question here is the barriers to travel as African people. Mm -hmm. Because number one, I've traveled in, in Asia, I've traveled in Europe, I've traveled in I've traveled to Australia. That was quite expensive. But then Europe, America. The challenge with traveling in Africa is that the cost is super prohibitive. That is number one. Travel even within the continent or mm. from the continent, it's super prohibitive. Mm. But at the same time, we have these what I'd call diplomatic restrictions mm. where I need to travel with a visa. I need to go and prostrate myself before the gods of the visa and beg yeah. for them to let me mm. go spend money mm. in, I don't want to mention any places because then I won't be able to get any visas. Mm. What has your experience been? And what do you think we as artists, creatives, travelers can do to try and open up maybe even just the continent? Let's start with like home. How do we open up? How do we make travel easier for our, us as Africans? So within the continent, I think, man, I, I, I don't even, I, I think I've just been, and I, my experience when it comes to travel yeah. has been so wonderful <laughs> it's crazy but the, i still get that anxiety mm -hmm. from knowing that i have to go apply for a visa yeah it's one of the processes that just gives me so much anxiety but i've never ever dealt with an unpleasant experience yeah. my younger brother has mm -hmm. um to, to a place that we, we've both traveled to before yeah his experience but the funny thing is that the person who was giving him a hard time mm -hmm. was a Kenyan. Yes. <laughs> Even though... It's it always so, your own people. Yeah, yeah, for like... And that... So that that was just... It didn't make sense. Where yeah. is the Kenyan at this... Um, at, she, it was just a very... You know that mentality yeah. that of authority and so you can give people stress just for the sake yeah. of it? That didn't make sense to him and to me yeah. as well. But my experience with embassies and yeah. applying has always been so pleasant yeah. and this is even before i i this is even before patricia, patricia Kihoro. Kihoro, yeah you know what i mean and even though the anxiety still stuck yeah it, it, i'd go there and it's such a pleasant experience and i'm like why do they make it feel like, like we it's have going to... to be, you have to do a song and dance of sorts. Yeah, because yeah. I remember the first time I went to the US, mm -hmm. um, 
there was a friend of mine who I met at the embassy and yeah. we were waiting together. So it was him, the mom and the dad, yeah. and they wanted to go for the sister's graduation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, first of all, the cost already yes. of just a visa application, uh, just application which yeah. is non-refundable. Very prohibitive. So for them, at the time, it was 8,000 bob. Yeah. So it was 24K for the family. And all of them were denied. And he, they went in before me. So, of course, I was just like, whoa, guys, just ask. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm feeling like you're going to be, yeah, <laughs> you know, like... It's it's like you don't know what's happen. You don't know what's gonna what's happen, going to happen at that. Yeah. You don't know what questions you're going to get, and I remember my interview was just so like three questions that yeah. were mm -hmm. yeah, coming good. back, yeah. yeah, and full stop. And I got like I was told on the same day yeah. that you got the visa. You got the visa, yeah. And so I wondered like what's what's the thing? What makes you not go and you go? go yeah. And it's that not knowing. Yes, the state of limbo. Exactly. Yeah. You can prepare. You can prepare so, so much, much, so well, but there's still no guarantee that you're yeah. going to go. Yeah. And that's the thing that it kind of reduces. It feels like it's reducing you it to less sort of than like, a human. Yeah, it humanizes you yes. to a certain level where you, that's why I always say it, it's very sad when you go, especially around the continent. Like mm. part of what I love is I love Ethiopia for one reason is that they've opened up. Mm -hmm. I love Ghana, they've opened up. Mm -hmm. I love, 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 love Rwanda mm -hmm. because you basically show up, mm -hmm. get your visa stamped at the airport, yeah. that's done. Yeah. I feel as Africans, we should be able to open up the continent more True. because we can spend that money here. True. We can try and support each other because True. on certain occasions, you, for instance, I worked a lot in Southern Africa for a very long time mm -hmm. and South Africa and everything, but even then, if, for example, I'm going to uh, do like teach a course at UCT, mm -hmm. what would happen is that they would say, we want a landline number for where you're going to be. And I'm like, who still has landlines? Wow. They basically yeah. have that. So it also depends on the category of visa you're applying for. There's always things. The first country that I traveled to internationally yeah. was New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And we needed to go through South Africa. Yes. So you take your flight to SA. So transit flight, visa, yeah. Then to Australia, yeah. then to New Zealand. Yeah. There was no interview. We just, somebody took our passports and the application, the, the passport was, it, they had to be sent to, sent South, to Africa, South Africa. Yeah. And then the visas were granted there. Yeah. But it, like, it's, we knew we were going. There wasn't any. There wasn't stress. any. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that, and that yeah. was when I was sixteen. Yeah. Then when I was seventeen, I went to the U.S. and yeah. there's the whole interview process and things, and you're just there like, hey, is it a job? Is it a what? <laughs> and then every other experience I have had to go for an interview. Yeah. Some have been, you know, like it, within Africa. Yeah. I've been to Egypt, mm -hmm. and that was also pretty simple. Yeah. I've been to Nigeria. Nigeria, mm -hmm. the first time I. The visa process yeah. in Nairobi took me 15 minutes. Wow. In and out. Yeah. Then the second time I went, visa on arrival. Yes. Um, South Africa, I think, is the one country that I've been to the most. Yes. Last year alone, I went maybe three times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, initially, you know, because, you know, you know you're going to go back and forth. So yeah. the first time I requested a longer, a longer visa. A longer, yeah. No. Then the second time... I didn't even ask, but they're like, okay, this chick is obviously travels here back. quite a yeah. bit. So they gave me a year. Uh, yeah. The year has passed us. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to extend these they, visas. They might extend these visas. But, you know, like the last time I applied for a U.S. visa, yeah. got the five-year one, which makes it a lot easier. Yeah. I remember when I applied, the last time I applied for a Schengen visa was yeah. to go to Cannes two years yeah. ago for Rafiki, and they gave me a three-year three -year visa. visa yeah. And it was only because we asked. Yes. Like, just ask. And I was like, wait, the concept of asking... It's always is, felt like yeah. I have to come here and just please give me whatever crumb you can. And we asked and they were like, okay. okay. Yeah. And so I don't know, maybe maybe things are changing. I hope things are changing. I really hope things are changing because to be honest with you, a lot of us don't really want to live mm. away from home. It's very difficult living away from home. It's not yeah. an easy thing. You're away from your family. You're away from your friends. You're away from your food, the weather. Yeah, I will be honest. The first time I went to the U.S., the person I traveled with yeah. 
they took advantage of that because uh-huh. we'd gone for a conference yeah. and then he disappeared. He ran away. So he did the thing that... Snitch, snitch. <laughs> Patricia, snitch. You need to snitch on such people. No. Snitching is no. bitching. It's, 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 it's. So I, I did experience yeah. the thing that they are they were afraid, like afraid of, of people yeah. doing. The person that I went with did the thing. You, know? you person, I know you're listening. Why would you do this to us? And I was us? like, okay, I get, I get then why. But at yeah. the same time, for them, I can I can understand that now they can't gauge. So who's gonna come back and who's not going to? Yeah, it's but, difficult. And I like that now. You know, they they're, they're a bit more. I feel like. Yeah. But also that just could be my own experience. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm only speaking from the from your experience. That I've had. Yes. So I don't know. There's people who are always saying, "Ah, nowadays it's so easy. Don't even stress." Yeah. And I'm still stressed. Yeah. And then I get it. So what I would say, I think, I'm I'm really honestly trying when borders open mm-hmm. <laughs> one not just to travel within the country because yeah. yes i love lamu mm-hmm. i love diani i mm-hmm. love kilifi but i want to explore more yeah samburu yes mass a bit exactly yes. i want to go to those places that have never crossed and my mind and they are so visit. like like mass a bit is just yeah. divine tukana is crazy Beautiful. yes and, and I hate the outdoors. So imagine me saying this. Wow. I love staying at home. I have PlayStation. I have Wi-Fi. I yeah. have three months worth of food here in case the yeah. apocalypse comes. I'm fine. Yeah. I think... Don't try me, people. Don't try and invade this place. I'll kill you <laughs> all of you. <laughs> the amount of money I've spent traveling to all these countries. Yes. Uh, you know, I've taken some time to sit down and think, and yeah, we... <laughs> when I'm feeling pain, paying for those tickets, those return tickets yeah. to go nowhere... <laughs> Imagine if I just spent that money here yep. and make travel here the priority. The priority, yeah. And then, you know, the other countries are beautiful. Other yeah. continents are definitely beautiful and worth visiting. Mm-hmm. But shifting that mindset, because I feel like a lot of people feel like, I am, I'm saving up to yeah, go, on, to a go holiday on a holiday there, in, yeah, Greenland or not whatever. knowing that the thing you're seeking you can find you can also here find here yeah yeah. yeah yeah i think that's that's a beautiful concept which brings me like it's almost 360 because now we're going to talk about how a lot of people know patricia kihol mm. which is through social media mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. first thing my girlfriend said when she knew we were interviewing you was like do you know that she has 200,000 followers do you know that you have 200, like you have more followers than John the Baptist. I think John the Baptist had like, what, five, five followers. And, and one of them was his mom, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow guys. Social media has done amazing things for a lot of people. Mm. The, it's launched careers. Yeah. There are people who basically make their living off social media. But mm. also there are negatives to social media yeah. because uh, a lot of people are living a lifestyle that is not theirs. Mm. A lot of people are basically looking at things and thinking why don't i have that there's a person driving a lamborghini and they're like six i don't even know how they're doing that but how 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 are they doing that Mm. as a person with more followers Mm -hmm. then i think the capacity of nyayo stadium believe that if 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 we had people like basically your followers go to nyayo stadium only fifteen thousand would be inside the rest would be apple uh, what wow, is that place where we eat Nyama? Stop it. Yeah, that, stop yeah. it. Stop anyway, how can you harness the power of social media to spread messages of positivity, mm. messages of encouragement, mm. and also realism? That's, that's the question I have. Yo. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> You've just like... You, have you never thought of it that way? No. You know, it's like if you watch the life of Brian, every time he turned around and did this, people would be like, uh-huh, tell us, tell us. Mm-hmm. So John the Baptist, five people plus his mom, so that's just four. Patricia Kihoro, two hundred thousand people. Hey, that's How a- do you harness this power for for good? That's a what was twenty five million. Oh, oh, most of those are bots. Onyak, you no, have like no, six no, million no. people. And all of them are I accounts that you made. So you think Beyonce is out there buying followers? No, it's not buying followers, but you have lots of bots that actually also follow people. That is true. Yeah. But you know, Instagram started doing that thing where they sort of clean it out. Um, as a person who's super into it, I can tell you like they, 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 they're one step behind. Can you tell me then if mine, I, like I wouldn't want 
people to think that I have no, 200,000 I... followers and half of them are bots. Mm-hmm. Like I would prefer to have like <laughs> less real people. Listen, than, than... and this is true. Uh-huh. I have four followers. One of them is my girlfriend. The other one is Franco, our gardener. And the other is uh, my girlfriend's grandmother. On which page? Because I follow you. Uh, oh, and the, the other one is you. It's like <laughs> just four people. <laughs> it's four people and following Sha- me. I think Shaz follows you. No, nah, she unfollowed me. Ah. And it's like, <laughs> like, this man has no juicy <laughs> stories. Unfollow. Um, okay, so this is the thing. Mm-hmm. Um Initially, for me, social media was just what it is for a lot of people. It's yeah. just a place for you to sort of express yourself, take pictures. You, you're also a photographer now. You know, you can put filters and it's like nice to see how your pictures look with a filter. And then to connect with people, yeah. you know, old high school friends and family around the world. It goes down in the DMs. <laughs> to meet people, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. And then, you know, that was my purpose for social yeah. media. I, I was getting on every platform, MySpace, High Five, Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, like all of them. Maya Gama, they, they, that, that, it's, it's a J- Japanese one. Sorry, I'm, you can tell like I, I don't have friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's what it's always been. Yeah. Because throughout everything I've done um, in terms of entertainment, whether it's radio or my, my social media still remained my page to just express yeah. myself, right? Yeah. And that's what it remains till today. Yeah. But some things became clear to me. There was a time on Twitter or Facebook, I was one of those people who, when I'm sad, I just put a black square and it's like sadness. Hey. And then people will be like, oh my God, what Patricia, is what's happening? Wrong? Are you okay? Yeah. I'm like, I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I was one of those. And then <laughs> somebody told me that they had wanted to reach out to me, but yeah. it looked like I was going through such a dark time. Yeah. That they just stayed away. And I was like, was that really the energy I was putting out? out? Yeah. And so I became very conscious of that. And then two, there was one time it hit me that I've grown up with a lot of insecurities around mm-hmm. my body. Yeah. And it's only because of all the magazines that I would consume. Mm-hmm. Everyone is perfect. Yeah. Everybody has been airbrushed or whatever. I didn't know there was airbrushing Brushing, being yeah. done. So I just thought, wow. Those thighs are so toned. My need to look like that. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, that skin is so clear. My skin needs, needs to, to look, look like, like that. that. So I always felt like I need to work on something. Mm. And then in learning that actually, no. No one is perfect. bodies look just so many different ways. Yeah. When I saw Beyonce's actual thighs or Serena Williams' yeah. thighs, because for me, cellulite was like, oh, mm-hmm. you'll never catch me in shorts. Yeah. And when I learned that actually this is, normal life, like yeah. people's bodies look so many different ways and i was like so it's just because people put out these perfect images mm-hmm. that i felt that there was something wrong with me yeah and i would hate for somebody to look at my page yeah and think since i, I look, don't look yeah. like that or since da, 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 there's then there's wrong something with wrong with me yeah and then even from a mental perspective there's a time i would get people asking me how are you happy all the time yeah yeah like yeah. oh you know sometimes i feel sad and i don't know what's wrong and i was like wrong, wrong. no it's okay to have low days yeah and so i became very deliberate about also sharing when i'm not having such a good yes. day it doesn't mean i'm sharing every minute of every day every because day, yeah. a lot of times if i'm not in a good space yeah you won't find me online yeah. to be honest but I made sure to then also, when I can, mm-hmm. to say, hey, sometimes, man, it's like it's really difficult, tough. Yeah. So that people can see that, okay, Patricia is somebody who's achieved this and this and this. But, but even living yeah. that lifestyle, she still goes through, through stuff this, this and this, yeah. that I go through. And so if, she's, if she can do that and still have this to deal with, mm-hmm. then so can I. Yeah. So that was something that I became very deliberate about. about doing, yeah. Right. And also to remain myself because yeah. I know how hard it is to sustain an image, an image or a persona that yes. is not true to you. Yeah. And I never want to ever feel like I'm struggling to, to, keep, to up keep up with yourself, with, with something that I've created <laughs> yeah. that is not the real me. And so what was really important is to keep people like my family and friends that I've known for a really a long, long time. time and my and my family. Yeah. Have I said family? Yes. Yes. So they re- like they remind me who I am, yeah. but I never forget now. Like it's every day, I am who I am, and that way, 
what I'm putting out is still me. It's still Patricia. So yes, when you say Patricia can speak to ambassadors, yeah. guess what? Even when I'm having conversations with ambassadors, I'm still goofing hood. off. Like You're I'm still, still like, <laughs> we'll yeah. crack jokes, right? This is the same way I'll have a conversation yes. with you. There's no, I mean, There's, yes, of course I can. Sit up straight. Yes, sir. You, uh, mm. It's very, very, very important that we sustain. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, it's yeah. who I am. It's who you are. I can try today to be one version of myself. Mm -hmm. That version is real, but yeah. guess what? They intertwine with all these other, other versions, versions yes. all the time. So I stopped trying to separate them. And that, and that's what Nairobi is. And yes. that's why this is titled Nairobi Nouveau, because Nairobi is Wagyu steak, bests, and also it's being stuck in traffic behind cows. Kulaing mutura. Yes. And getting the worst stomachache of your life, Onyach. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I've been I've been invited to an uh, like an ambassador's house yeah. for an event, but since I'm running late, I will show up on a border. On undo this, it, yes, it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Guess yeah. what? <laughs> that is Nairobi. <laughs> and if you see me driving, mm -hmm. trust me, it's not a tea. Hey, but just visa and shagari at panda undo this. Imagine ni tai panda bado. Because I I love I. People ask, people think I go to the airport and undo the because I'm late. No, it's because I just like it. Real. It's, no, it's not <laughs> really, it's nice. You're saving time. You're saving you don't money. have to plan three hours to go to the airport because of traffic and do security. No, I can have those three hours to pack nicely, to have lunch. And then I'll just use 20 minutes to get to the airport with my small suitcase. Nikifika security na shuka. And then I see somebody in a car there alone. Hi. Hi. Can I? Like me, so, apo, get, get B. terminal. Yeah. So, in, some, in fact, one day so I was thinking, somebody asked me if you were to have a book, what would you call it? And I was like, catching borders, crossing borders. Hey. 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 Do we still Danger. Have, Danger. Yes. Danger. Patricia, we are approaching <laughs> the end of our podcast, sadly. But the question that now I want to present to you is mm. that, you have so many talents. Thank you. You have so many talents. And these talents don't come easy. You work very hard at those. Um, see, I was following her page for work, baby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, how do creatives then monetize this? How do you earn a living from all of these things? Because sometimes it's very easy for you to do all of these things. And still, we've, we've had situations where we have people whose films they've made films that are winning awards and they can't pay their rent mm. they can't they can't make rent yeah how do we monetize how what is your advice in terms of monetizing i think i am very very blessed to be able to do various things mm -hmm. and i'm very grateful to have had the opportunities to do all these different things simultaneously yes right so you know, for five and a half years, I worked on radio. Yeah. Um, and I got a small, very modest salary from that. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I can say this. I, I was taking home 25K from radio. People don't... The, the people funny thing is radio does radio. not... It doesn't. Yeah. I have several friends who've been in various radio stations. Mm. And if they tell you how much they get paid, you're like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that yeah. much. And uh, it's a lot of work. Because <laughs> if you're doing, for example, like a morning show, you have to be there like at 4 a.m. It's not easy. I... I I honestly, like, I, I, I couldn't even complain about my salary because yeah. it was just on Sundays, yeah. right? And it's two hours of the show. Mm -hmm. And preparation for that show for me was every day because for me, preparation was just to listening music, to yeah. music and having conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, it was, it's it's a modest amount, but for me, it was, okay, this is my internet. Yeah. This is my airtime yeah. and power, right? And then having the opportunity to be invited to MC events based off of my radio job yes. and based off of, you know, conversations that I've had with people, people yeah. I was able to monetize by, you know, hosting yeah. events and charging for that. And then my work, I can't say film and acting <laughs> were significant mm -hmm. in terms of pay, to be yeah. honest. Um, but I got to be the musical supervisor for Rafiki, for instance, nice. because of yes, my work, of your work on, in music, in, in music yeah. and radio. Um, that job didn't pay me. You know, that was, in fact, it, Wanuri is my friend. She was just like, yo, I, yo. I, I think as, at the same time, it's the same time we have friends who like 
if they ask something, I, I'll step up. It's like, yeah. I need this. It's like, are you asking or are you telling it's me? It's a privilege. Yes. It's a pri- like, in, in fact, I'm grateful also to have the friends that I have who see things in me that I might not, not even see. Not see in yourself. So for Jason, yes. you know, to see me and think she yeah. would do well in an improv, in an improv show, show yeah. that's something to be grateful for. For Wanori to see me as not just her friend yeah. or her friend who's a radio presenter who likes music, but somebody who can curate, curate music, music for, for a film, film. Yes. that's a privilege in itself. Uh, to have somebody see that, okay, because you do such a great job mm-hmm. curating music on radio, how about translating, translating that, that into a live event, event every yeah. week? And so I'm able to monetize in yeah. that way. So I think it's also just having the presence of, of mind, mind to too. not think that as a musician, the only way you can, you can make, make money, money is through making music and doing shows. There's yeah. so many ways to ways expand that. Yeah. And I think my gratitude lies in having the people around me who show me how I can be a, an expanded version of myself. So even now with YouTube, I enjoy making YouTube yes. videos. I love learning how to edit. Yeah. I love being up at four in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, the other day, my brother and I were up and he's doing his thing on his computer and me, I'm just on YouTube watching more tutorials. And I was like, Jomo, <laughs> it's three in the morning. Why am I, why am I doing this? I should go sleep, yeah. you know? And YouTube is a way to monetize this. Yes. So even with social media, um, the fact that I enjoy curating an Instagram page and sharing pictures and creating funny little videos, it's a privilege to have brands look at look me at you, and yeah. think, wow, we would love, love to have this woman feature us on her pages and mm-hmm. her platforms and speak about us. Yeah. One, because the content will be great. Yeah. And two, and I learned this very recently from someone who's been in the industry for a long time, mm-hmm. who told me that, Patricia, when people work with you, you legitimize them. Them, yes. And yes. that shifted something for me because I was like, wow. This is this is funny that you say that. I think this is so fortuitous because the next question I had for you was that on certain occasions, you find that you work with certain brands or associate with certain brands mm-hmm. and something unfortunate happens mm-hmm. and you are no longer or they do not represent your ideals. Mm-hmm. How does one protect themselves from this? For instance, uh, Onyach wants to... Uh, associate his brand with success but he sucks at fifa so <laughs> you guys are killing how, me. how do you how do you separate yourself from this for example there's um i think last year and this was very touching for me because there's certain things that i like to be very aware of uh there was a brand that was i i don't want to say okay so this brand allegedly provides sub products for the African market Mm -hmm. as compared to what they have out there in Mm -hmm. Europe, in America, in Australia, in all these places. And you had people who are brand ambassadors to this brand. And instead of, I think sometimes it's very important for brands to own up and say, yeah, we may be doing this. We are learning. We're going to improve. They were like, no, we're going to take all these influencers and ship them off to a place so that they can talk about how awesome our products Mm. are. How do you stop yourself from getting trapped within that? This podcast is called Chatterbox because Mm. the business world can be a box. You can be boxed into situations that are not ideal. How do you prevent yourself from being boxed into those situations? So one, I only align myself to brands or businesses that one, I use, mm-hmm. or two, I'm curious about, yeah. or three, I can vouch for and yeah. stand by mm-hmm. regardless. Regardless of what happens, yes. Yeah, so for instance, like the brand, you're, I know who you're talking about. Yes. They had reached out to me, mm-hmm. and even that incident of them take, shipping them shipping people off, that happened yeah. even before the funeral. Before, yeah. Yeah, so they had reached out to me, but for me, one of the things, I just don't use... The their product. brand yes not even the brand yeah. the product the products, itself yes, yeah i use something totally different so i had to tell them yo i i don't i don't use, use your product yeah and they're like no but you know we just want you to to, to, to say speak, you know to talk yeah. about and i was like no nah. i can't because to be honest the last time i used your product yeah. was when i was in high school yes so i said no the budget, like they were just, they were actually saying, no, you tell us how much we how much charge you us. Want, you know, yeah. tell us how much you want. One of the things I've learned is that 
you know that thing I was saying of sustaining something that you're not. Yes. I would not have been able to sustain a conversation around something that I don't. That you do not. Do. I really appreciate you for doing that. But and it's something that I had to learn. Yes. Um and for me it's because I love creating content. Mm-hmm. I'm not a content creator in the sense of somebody who can pre-shoot content. Yes. And I tell brands a lot when they want to work with me that my content is not dependent on you, you or your product. Yeah. My content is dependent on my life and your lifestyle, yes. And so if I pre-shoot if I had a shoot today and I shot 100 amazing images that can last me 100 days, but by day 3, yeah. I'm not feeling that's not my mood That's anymore. That's not your mood anymore. You have to switch it. So I have to create new content yes. on that day. I've tried it. It just doesn't work wow. for me. Yeah. I'm very spontaneous. Sometimes ideas come to me in my dreams. Or sometimes I can be seated here. And I see you've done something. And I'm like, yeah. uh-huh. <laughs> We just gave like a goose egg to yeah. uh, Patricia before we started recording this podcast. <laughs> so I think she's hinting that she wants one of these baskets to put a goose egg in. And your wish hey, will be you, granted. You, you said it, not me. Oh, see? <laughs> it's your idea. How put brilliant things are out you? into the world. <laughs> put things it out into the world. And so because I love and I want to continue enjoying Creating. to create this content, the only way I can sustainably do it is if I'm creating content around things that are in my everyday life. That's true. So I can only speak about something that I have in my house and I'm using And you're using, it. yes. Because if I don't use it, I will forget. There's this thing, I, object permanence, yes. which is the thing that makes it so if I put something in the fridge and I put it too far back and I don't see it, I forget, forget it about exists. it, yeah. So that's how I can shop. If I shop for stuff and then it's put away, I'll forget about it. You have it. that and then you go get new then stuff. Then I'll go buy it again. It's happened. So imagine if I align myself with something that I don't use. I will struggle to create, to create content, content because it's not something it, it's that's not a you. part of my everyday. Yeah. So if you see me creating content about something, trust me, I use it. <laughs> I use it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good to know. We actually have points of convergence on various things mm-hmm. because we work with some of the brands that you actually work with. Mm-hmm. And so it's always good for us to see someone actually do something and say, and I, one thing I love about the things that you make is that you don't just talk about, oh, this is great because mm. of this. You're like, I wish they would do this to make it better. Yeah. Because then that is creative feedback as yeah. opposed to people who just go out and say, this is amazing. It's the best thing. Mm. So there's a product that you said would be great if they had an app for. Yeah. And it's, I don't know how it would work, but <laughs> as a person who struggles with sleep. Yeah. I would, I would definitely buy a product that basically could be able to like sleep track or whatever. There's actually, I mean, they're not here yet yes. in this hour, Kenya, mm-hmm. but I have heard of um, such. Such, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I've I, heard of such I've, products being advertised. Yeah, I, I, I've been to, it's called the X factory where they, is it factory or warehouse? We always drive past it, Rachel, when we're coming from the mall, uh, when we're in Virginia. Um, <laughs> wow! <Well, laughs> when you know, when we're all, all, all the way in Virginia, <laughs> just driving. Also, when we are in Gikomba and we're driving. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. that would be great to do. We're coming to the close of the podcast. One question that we a reality that we're living in right now is COVID. Mm. It's difficult for a lot of creatives out there. What would you say to people who at this time are struggling? Because a lot of people are, especially creatives, they're people whose livelihoods have just been shattered. Yeah. They're people who are struggling to create right now. They're mm. people who are in very bad places. What would you say to these people? I think if, if we're talking about struggling to create, one of the things I have learned with time is to lean into everything. If mm-hmm. on a good day, if you create when you're happy on a good day, that's great. Yeah. But you can still create around the thing that you're struggling with. Like okay. you can create, something can come out of the bad, bad day things, as well. Yes. As, and, and, and learning to honor that, you know, I've learned through my Instagram or yeah. YouTube or whenever I share what I'm dealing with or struggling with, mm-hmm. There's a balance. And for people to see that they're able to resonate yes. with not just the good, 
but also, also the, the bad. bad. Yeah. Because think about it, you have your good days and your bad, but if you have a friend who is just constantly celebrating, yes. it will exhaust you. I hate those people. And it's not because you're feeling bad that they're always yeah. celebrating, but there's days that you will need somebody to commiserate, to commiserate with, with or to yes. say, yo, I'm yeah, having I've a tough there. time, yeah. and they can say, yo, I've, I've, I'm going through, I'm going the, through same. the same thing. Yeah. And you're able to, whether it's talk through it or get strength from each other. Mm -hmm. So... The balance is that even in your pits, yes, whatever you create out of that, mm -hmm. you can still honor that. It's yeah. still something it's still worth something honoring. Worth honoring yeah. And you will connect with someone. Someone will resonate with it. And art, art makes people feel. Whether yes. it's feeling good, whether it's feeling bad, whether it's, whether it's feeling getting in mood, touch yeah. with their. You know, that's like for me, there's the Grey's Anatomy episodes that I watch when I really need to cry, mm -hmm. you know, because I need to cry. Yeah. And it's the release that then helps me get to a better place. So I, I know what you mean. I, yeah. I watch The Flying Guillotine, uh, which is like a, like a kung fu film when I need to cry. This is amazing. It's mm -hmm. just amazing cinematography. I don't cry. I actually laugh at the people. And it's, it's another story. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think that's what I would say to creators who are struggling. Yeah. Um, I know about writer's block yeah. or the creative block. There's a time I used to work as a writer as yeah. well. And when just lean into it and honor those times when things are not great, it's okay. Like yeah. it's because the fiction comes when you fight it. Yeah. And when you think of it as this is this wrong, is, this I is wrong. should yeah. be like this. I yeah. should be creating. I should be brilliant. I should be churning out all the time. That adds on another layer of pressure yeah. Yeah. that makes it even more difficult to ride through the law. I, I like what you're saying, but I'm also getting something that the research department did not get. She is a writer. No, no, no. I, mm. Uh huh. I research want... department, <laughs> pay cuts. <every> okay, <laughs> there's a couple of things which we haven't tackled. I've yes. worked as a writer, yes, true. But uh -huh. also, I studied psychology and I've worked as a psychologist. Ooh, when I was six. <laughs> 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 or do I have to pay for this? <laughs> <laughs> Patricia, yeah. it's been great having you. Thank but you. we have an obligatory question we always ask everyone who sits on this couch is, what are you reading what are you listening to? What are you watching? But I'm, I'm always very cautious of asking people who've done everything. Are you just reading the things that you've written? It's, what was it? Crossing borders on a border. Are you, are you reading your own book? Are you watching Makutano Junction? Oh, and then are you listening to your own music? Just sitting in no. like a bubble of Patricia Kihoro. You have like, uh, what are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you watching? So, wow. Um, reading. I've really struggled to read this year. Mm -hmm. I started the year reading Haruki Murakami's Women Without Men Without Women. Yeah. And I'm halfway through it, or maybe three quarter way, and it's just been stuck at that for the last five months. Mm -hmm. But my friend Sharon and I just started a book club. Ooh. And it's called Chasing Paper. Well, we didn't just start it, it's been in existence for years. Yeah. But now we've just introduced it to the world. Yeah. So it's on Instagram, it's called Chasing Paper Books, and mm -hmm. we're starting in August yes. with our first official book being Big Magic mm -hmm. by Elizabeth Elizabeth Gilbert. Okay. So that's our August book. So yeah. it's a book I've tried before, and I struggled yeah. a little bit. So we're starting again, and it's really just speaking to where I'm at yeah. right now as a creative. Yeah. I'm just realizing that I've been really, really leading with fear yes. a lot. So the reason I said yes very quickly to this is because I could feel the fear of Guy, your podcast, boy, what are they going to ask me? No, don't say, say that, Patricia. You, you, you. Honestly, all those thoughts were in my head, but it's almost like year of yes where yeah. I'm saying yes. You said yes to, to a talk you were giving yesterday. Uh, uh, you see Berkeley. Yes. Bruh. Oh my god. Imagine. I saw I saw the I saw the zoom. I saw the zoom and there were how many people were there? That was quite a bit. I don't even know. I didn't ask. Yeah. I think I think oh god, it was almost a hundred and something. There were quite a few. I'm not sure. If, yeah. But also a lot of the people in that class have reached out to me on Instagram. They're Ooh. they're 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 young yeah. and they like even one we're gonna do a live on Tuesday next week. Mm -hmm. But tune they, in. 
but they had such wonderful things to yeah. say about you know my speaking to them and the the truth is i've done about three or four of those in the last month nice um i just like was like let me not even think of it as a big deal because it's not yeah. but this one now made me feel like wow now it's it, it the, wow. the reality set in wow um so yeah um I'm trying no I'm not trying to you I am are. I am moving beyond the fear. Nice. So Big Magic is our August book and f- for me partly that's the reason why I want I want to read it now because yeah. August I'm taking a break from working with brands. Yes. I'm not I'm I'm pausing mm-hmm. because I want to sort of just sit down with myself beyond the fear and look at myself yeah. without fear and say okay so who's patricia now moving forward yes. there's been this clarity that a lot of people have spoken about mm-hmm. during this covid shut, um people being indoors, indoors they've had yeah. to face themselves a lot yeah. and there's a lot of clarity that has come for a lot of people and i feel like i've been having been a lot having of a clear lot of messages nice. so i want to sit down and then now figure out who i am when it comes to working with brands and when it comes to what i'm creating yeah. and so that in december i'm imagining spread your wings like a butterfly you guys have to pay extra she just oh, sang yeah. on this podcast <laughs> yeah. what are you watching i am um, wow this past week i started watching american horror story oh, <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> nearly wow i was like this during the day <laughs> like my heart beating like yeah. what have i gotten myself into but then i just kept going and now i'm you invested you like invested. now i'm just yeah. like <laughs> that's yeah, so that. kill that one <laughs> and that one i started watching suits again oh <clears throat> well yeah i started watching suits again but i'm also watching dark what what season are you on the first one hey dark is complicated oh you better like buckle up hey, yeah, it, yeah. let it me gets... tell you i am watching it and then i stop rewind start again then i ask my jamo i live with my brother yes. it's not clear <laughs> so, it's not like she's calling like evil spirits now like jemo jemo come and watch this with me jemo like jemo kenyatta oh jemo kenyatta jemo yes, jemo okay so he usually sits there at the dining table and i'm like jemo so uyu ni mgani uyu ni sema ule so wameenda ya gani like so so he's he's like my it's a sounding index board. yeah the index yeah. Yeah, so that i refer to but then i'm also watching it with google cuz i i'm just like am i get the, what I feel really dumb watching I was it. I was no you you shouldn't. I was <laughs> watching it in in December because I was I I, I caught a flu when we went on holiday. Mm-hmm. And so in, I spent in uh, <laughs> I spent I spent uh I think a week uh just alone trying not to infect people. Mm-hmm. That's what you should do with covid. Don't spread this thing. Mm. So I watched it and I basically drew a, a site map because I, wow. I like to be able. And then now season I just finished season 3 because it just came out yeah. and I was like this wow. is useless. So it's very intense. Wow. But mm. if you want some light watching, I just started watching Norsemen. I don't know if you watched that. I've heard. Is I think my brother told me about yeah, it. Yeah, go watch it. It's I think you'd like it very much. Mm. It's uh about Vikings, but it's it's very funny. It's just hilarious. It's not really about plundering and rape and pillaging and okay. going. And okay. interesting fact for our learners at home is that the word kiosk was actually made up by uh Vikings. So you can only say after raping and pillaging, you can go and get souvenirs at the kiosk. Um uh, I don't know if that is helping the CBC children at home, but what a statement. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Finally, what are you listening to Patricia Kiol? Hey, I'm listening to everybody. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I started working out 1st of July. Big up yourself. Hey, come on. And so I would listen to podcasts yes. as I was working out and there's a podcast I listen to called The Friend Zone. Yes. which I love. Where Sticky lives in permanently. Oh. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 <laughs> My gosh. Wow. Sticky is our executive hey. producer, really cool dude. Hey, uh hey, but hey. yeah. We we shit. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is brutal. Uh-huh. So yeah, it's called a friend zone. <laughs> It's it's it, they speak about mental health, mental wellness uh-huh. because their tagline is because who in the hell wants a musty brain? Okay. But they're really cool. I love the conversations that they have. Yes. And then I just started listening to It's Related I Promise, which is a Kenyan podcast. Oh. 
And then I was also binging on any podcast that Hugh Jackman has been on. Yes. Do you have a crush on Hugh Jackman? Maybe professionally. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I like how you segue to that. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, professionally. And then music. Uh-huh. Um, Zinia. Yes, Zinia. Mana- we, we actually are supposed to have her on the show really soon if she makes if she has time yeah yes. she's she's dope but also so music wise because I, i'm listening to a lot of artists at the same time yeah the gym has been getting harder and harder so there's yeah. a playlist i have on my apple music that's gospel music <laughs> <laughs> that I found where you need divine intervention because <laughs> it's like when you call me i will respond <laughs> <laughs> and um but you know there's there's other playlists on there on apple music okay. if people want to find them yeah. to see what i'm listening to it's oh. called my, my name is Patricia Kihara on there, so they can find that. Patricia, it's been so amazing to have you on this particular podcast. She's also listened to this podcast or watched it on the YouTubes. Yeah. Uh, executive producer for this podcast is one sticky Eric Muridi, a uh, mm-hmm. guy who has stamped his passport permanently in the friend zone. I think he's getting residency. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> audio sound engineer is the one and only Onyach Kaleb, also known as DJ OCS. We've had our graphics and display person as the very lovely Rachel Margaret Jones. She's just getting credit because she's my girlfriend. But uh, <laughs> director for the show and also the writer, um, very amazing photographer, but also videographer and editor, Mr. Wanjira Gateri Humphrey. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm the host. It has been a pleasure to have Patricia Kihoro. We want you to close this show with closing remarks. Tell the people what you want. Well, what do I want? I want like a, a, a lot of money. Yes. And um, like, um, I think I'm ready for love. Approved. It's like a bay. Approved. And, like maybe. Okay, no, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I think everybody just needs to just glow, bask in the glow of who they are. Like, they, like I feel like everybody is dope. And they just need to know that, like, who, what, where you are is exactly where you're supposed to be. And so revel in that. I have nothing to add to that. Thank you very much, guys, and we'll see you next time.